Welcome back to Bulls with the Bard. My name is Cakes, I am your host. Today we are talking with Stephanie Craniola. Steph is a master of early modern English literature. Shakespeare is her passion, her boyfriend, her degree credentials, and her podcast. Well, one of them at least. Steph is a jack of all wholesome niche chaos nerd content and a jack of all things podcasts. She has a D&D &D podcast called Adventure Incorporated, a soccer podcast called Swoon Tower Soccer, a chat stream called In Addition, and absolutely no time to start anything else. Her favorite Shakespeare play is Cymbeline because she thrives on chaos and being extra, and she is here today to talk about her Shakespeare podcast, the Protest Too Much podcast, and women of varying body types in Shakespeare. I am so excited to share our conversation with you, but first, I got a little high and Steph popped some champagne. <laughs> y'all we are back with Steph Cragnola. Steph how did you spend your quarantine? Sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually spent it doing a lot of Shakespeare. Um, I started the week that we went into lockdown. I started very similarly but on a much smaller scale to the show must go online my Shakespeare group that's based out of Rhode Island, we started doing weekly reads. We would just do like a randomizer for the cast list. And then people could just read the show. We streamed them through Facebook. We did a couple, um, couple of real silly, real fun ones. We did that through the summer. Um, and then I also spent it watching a lot of show must go online doing mm -hmm. their shows. Mm -hmm. And then I started a Shakespeare podcast. So kind of consuming a lot of Shakespeare and doing a lot of of online Shakespeare. You know, just like a teeny tiny amazing <laughs> podcast that has <laughs> blown my mind and taken over my world. I love it so much. It is so smart. I have like kind of two categories of podcasts in my life. Like one are the ones that I binge, but I binge them while I'm doing other things. So I'm not necessarily paying attention to them mm -hmm. all the time. And then there's the ones that I'm like, oh, I love this. Like I need to be able to pay attention to this. So I like get through it so slowly so I can make sure I like savor every second. And your <laughs> podcast is in category two. Like I just love listening to it so much. So I have to make sure I can like sit down and give it all my time. And I just like want to know how you came up with the idea because it is so different from any other like Shakespeare podcast I've ever listened to. Um, so I actually, I had the idea of it in April of, no, that's not how time works. Mark happens first <laughs> before April in maybe January, February, I guess of 2020, because it was before everything shut down that I had the idea for it. Oh, wow. I was listening to No Holds Barred and such a good podcast. Yes. Uh, yes. I had just like done a full month of binging No Holds Barred and I was like, I could, cause I have a couple other podcasts and a couple other streams that I do. And I was like, I should do a Shakespeare podcast. Like that seems like something that I am uniquely qualified for, but I didn't want to do a summary podcast because there are so many good ones out there that there's no reason for me to add my voice. To, like there's just, no one needs me summarizing the plays. <laughs> um, I mentioned to Michaela earlier that I do have a blog that does summaries uh, where I drink a bottle of champagne and then read the play and get a, a lot more aggressive as <laughs> as the night goes about the play but yeah I didn't want to do a summary play I just wanted to do something that was really quick and because I was still teaching full-time I didn't want to do something that required prep on my part mm. I wanted <laughs> all of that which sounds super lazy uh and it is but that's kind of how I, I landed on protest too much. So the guest gets to choose both of the sides of the argument. I have to make it up on the spot. So it kind of like draws on my improv training, draws on the fact that like I have a pretty decent understanding of most of the plays in general. But yeah, just kind of like happened pretty, pretty organically. It's, it's 
incredible. <laughs> like people will come in and uh, like, sometimes people come in and they're like, nice. I feel mm-hmm. like, and other times I feel like people come in and they think they're going to throw you a curveball, And then I'm like, oh, Steph, you're so smart. <laughs> you're too smart for your own good. Like you just, you just, you nailed it. <laughs> like I appreciate that. Smart is like the last thing I would use to describe myself, especially on that show. But like, I appreciate the descriptor. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, really incredible. Um, I guess my other question is like, what do you feel like you have gotten out of the experience of, of doing all of it? What haven't I, uh, <laughs> I have met so many people doing this podcast. I think that's the biggest thing is, is just the explosion of resources in human form that I've found doing this podcast, because a lot of people, like I've worked with a ton of people, um, doing shows out in new England. I've done a lot of shows with folks down here in Austin, connecting with people through the show must go online, gave me like a world full of, of folks to reach out to. And then I, it's just grown from there with TikTok. I started meeting people on TikTok and like, now I've got this whole, this whole group of folks who have been willing to come on my silly little show and yell a little bit about Shakespeare. And I just feel like the world, I'll tell you, um, this is kind of like a hint into what we're going to talk about later, but there's a very specific kind of person that I want to be friends with in the Shakespeare world. And it's someone who has a little bit of like an irreverent view of the works who doesn't hold them too, too close. There's no like bardolatry there. Um, you have this willingness to explore and have fun with characters and texts that have been around for 450 years. The other type of person is, you know, someone who is not willing to have that fun and is very rigid in their thinking and doesn't want to be goofy and play Kiss, Mary Kill with three different shakes. <laughs> so I feel like I've discovered that the second world that I thought I was very much alone in, because I felt before, like, I have all of these thoughts and ideas but no one, no one shares them. And that's not true. So many people do. And that's the biggest thing that the podcast has brought me is like knowing that people do have like fun. (laughs) It's, it's made me so like excited for the future of Shakespeare, because I feel like I have always considered myself like, oh, I'm the Shakespeare girl in my area. Maybe they exist elsewhere. (laughs) I don't know. And like listening to your podcast has been like, oh my God, yes, they do. They exist everywhere. And I'm only, I think I'm only on like season four. I scroll through to get to the (laughs) episode that I'm on. And I'm like, there is so much here. There are so many people you've talked to. They come from all over the world. Yeah. Like it's mind boggling. And you're so right. Like the amount of times that I found, I find myself like snapping my fingers at (laughs) what they have to say. Like yeah. people are really getting on board with more progressive Shakespeare. And yeah. that's so exciting and wonderful. So nice. Yeah. Yes. I've done two full years almost. Um, August will be two years of this show. And it's a weekly show. I haven't, knock on wood, missed a week yet. But I've had very few repeat guests. So I haven't counted, but I probably have, you know, close to like 85, 90 guests that I've had on the show. And like, like you said, from all over the world and all different like um, experiences with Shakespeare, we've had actors, we've had academics, we've had directors, we've had scholars, like we've had so many different types of people who engage, like just enthusiasts. It's, it's awesome. I love it so much. (laughs) Yeah. I literally just listened to the episode where you talk to somebody about um, like what plays could have the best scores. And I was like, oh, such a good episode. Yeah. So good. And so Bill Barclay good. just did music at the Globe. Yeah, you know. He was just the music director <laughs> for the Globe. No biggie. Okay. And he's like, I would love to come on your podcast. And I was like, you would? I mean, when you first messaged me, I have not <laughs> heard of you. And once I listened to an episode, I was like, do I ever want to be on your podcast? Like I can't imagine a Shakespeare person who wouldn't once they understand the concept. Yeah. I think it's because like, I, I've cultivated a, a group and like the things that I watch 
So obviously I saw your videos and I was like, yes, this is the kind of person <laughs> I want to talk to. And just like the audience that we've, that we've cultivated, we have very few people who are super rigid in their, in their thinking. And so like, I think they might not love my show, but yeah. I haven't encountered anyone yet. So <laughs> well, that's good. Hopefully, yeah. you know, more and more people who, who are more broad thinkers continue to appear and maybe yeah. some of the more rigid people will start to open their minds as well just a little yep. bit just a little <laughs> speaking of which part of what I, I wanted to have you on the show for is that like the whole point of this season is that I feel like in these quarantine times we could have mm -hmm. addressed more important issues within the industry and within Shakespeare specifically and I know like issues of body positivity and women in Shakespeare and kind of the combination of both of those things are important to you. Yeah. So I'm curious about like, how do you think we are maybe not doing as well as we could be in those areas as it relates to Shakespeare and how you think we could maybe do better? Yeah, so this um a lot of this kind of started for me uh, I was told that I, I will never play a pants role because oh. I have like a larger chest than normal I cannot put on a vest and you know quote unquote look like a boy whatever that means to whoever is casting right mm -hmm. and I want to <laughs> my top top dream role is Imogen from Cymbeline which you would be perfect for like I I think so but, yeah. <laughs> but like so much of what the pandemic opened up is shoulders up acting and all of a sudden we started you you saw audience starting to accept oh here's a Rosalind and you don't have to you can put a hat on or whatever and everyone else on zoom is just treating her like a boy treating her like she's presenting as a boy. So we're just going to believe it. And I think there's so much room for that on stage because audiences don't, they're not that dumb. Like I know sometimes <laughs> we want to pretend they are, that we have to do all of this work for them to believe whatever they're watching Shakespeare. They know what they know they're going to a play. They don't have to actually believe what you know again whatever that means that I'm a boy that's not like that suspension of disbelief should you should trust your audience to just accept that I mean if they can believe that like Hermione got turned into a statue for mm -hmm. 16 years they can believe that someone with boobs gets mistaken for a man right if they can believe <laughs> Jupiter descending from uh, on the wings of a golden eagle throwing thunderbolts <laughs> yes <laughs> So, precisely <laughs> yeah stuff just stuff like that like the audience is you don't want to make them work too hard and you don't want to have to make them overthink things but you can just change your costume and the characters on stage have decided that they're perceiving you as a different gender and you can just roll with that like you can just do that you don't even extending beyond that beyond the pants rolls I think that women playing the men in Shakespeare doesn't have to be as much of a production as a lot of folks want it to be or or try to make it I don't have to be I played Hal a couple of years ago in Henry V and I didn't have to pretend to be a boy mm -hmm. playing Hal like I could just play Hal um I think that Ops Fest does a really great job with pronouns yeah you can be the pronouns character as written you can be pronouns that you've had experience with you can keep them like those are your options and I think those are really great options to work with the text done yeah easy audience isn't gonna notice if you switch 450 year old uh text little bits here and there they don't care no and it, it's actually so interesting to see like what you can say by just making that switch and without needing to put anything else on that like yeah I can see how just having you play how can say something about the dynamics of what it looks like to have a woman in power 
like just that alone like yeah and that's interesting and gives us a a point in producing these 400 year old works yeah and and you can like that gives the audience so much more to think of on their own so I we we kept all masculine pronouns for Hal I played Hal as a man but I didn't like make myself a man Mm -hmm. if that makes sense Mm -hmm. um so I'm quite physically not a man um so the audience can take that with what they will but also like my experiences as a woman bringing that to this male role I think made for a really interesting um just juxtaposition of of like gender experience and uh what it means to be a king and what it means to have these responsibilities and the interactions with Falstaff and King Henry were amplified by that as well Hmm. Hmm. that is so interesting I really love that I really want to play, I really want to play Hal again. Cause I think that I was at a point where like, I had just moved here. Um, I was so excited and so ready and it's still like, I feel like I can do so much more with it. You know how, and whenever a show ends, you're like, okay, I'm ready to do it again. <laughs> I feel like one of the Shakespeare dreams is like play Hal in all three. Like, yeah. I am yeah. desperate desperate to play Hal in all three. Oh. We had a company out here who was working on doing all of the histories and repertory before the pandemic started and they got the first four open but then it hit so oh, they no. didn't get to do it and it was such a bummer but yeah like one actor I know got to do it he got to do all three and it was <sighs> so cool. <laughs> I just I think it would be really cool to like go through the entire, yeah, like the entire history series with the same actors. It's a lot of work on those people. And it it relies on a lot of resources, knowing that you'll have space available in a year from now when you're three plays in and like, you know, a pandemic not happening. <laughs> but just to see the character evolution would be amazing. Oh, so yes. good. Yes. So good. So I guess speaking of like, visions of Mm -hmm. different characters and plays as we are talking about the importance of like women and body inclusivity like do you have any visions of characters or plays that you would like to see with those changes in mind you know what I my experience with directing is very much nobody else wants to so I guess I will hmm Mm -hmm. So I have like one directorial vision, uh, which has nothing to do with like gender or, or size of inclusive casting. It just has to do with the set. I just like have a really cool set idea for Hamlet. I want to do it like a donut, like, um, all of like scaffolding in a ring. So it's theater in the round, but the opposite, the audience is in the middle and they're all in swivel chairs. Okay. Like feel as trapped as Hamlet feels as everything's happening around them. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. (laughs) that's the only thing that I like have like visions for but I do think that I would like to see a lot more of the histories and of the like traditionally the traditionally masculine characters I would really like to see women playing some of those roles in Troilus and Cressida Mm. um Mm -hmm. in a lot of the like king roles I think that so much can be said by changing those to queens and seeing like how the relationships differ because I there's so much room to explore there and I think a woman in power is uh (laughs) fascinating to like get the chance to have masculine text as a woman I just think that's it's different like the text he writes for men is different than the text he writes for women absolutely absolutely I I think that that's so interesting I'd love to see like all of them done with women in those roles. And I think if we're looking, we're talking about the progression of histories with, now the, I've, I've decided I have a vision. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would really like to see, um, starting with a gender flipped Richard II, like a fully gender flipped, because I think that the, the queerness of Richard is very, very important to maintain. And, there are sometimes casting and I'm, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm really happy 
that you put a woman in this male role, but like Achilles and Patroclus, I think have to say stay a same sex couple <laughs> because it loses so much of the the power of that relationship when you flip them like that. So mm-hmm. I think if we're we're starting with a Richard II and then moving through with like a a female queen experience, I just think that would be really rad because we get to see all of how it progresses and changes. That would be so interesting. I'm I'm like just look, thinking about Richard too. I'm thinking about like, what does it look like for women to enable a bad leader? Yeah. And then for a woman to realize that they're not necessarily as great as they thought that Suited like- did for this. What, is, what does that even mean? Because we like so rarely get to see women in those positions anyway. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah so interesting. And allowed to be flawed. Yeah. Shakespeare's female characters are far less flawed than the men. They are just across the board, quote unquote, better people, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which we could have a whole separate conversation about what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare still lived in a very patriarchal uh, society. So yeah, um, I think that seeing the women as queens and seeing them be flawed and seeing mother-daughter relationships, uh, seeing like a, a Henry IV mm-hmm. and a Hal relationship changes very much. The Hamlet that I'm doing this fall is um, we've got Polonia. So it is a, a gender flipped with pronouns flipped mother and like, oh, huh, that, that w- putting a mother in that manipulative role of Ophelia is, huh. it, it's, I <laughs> just saw Apollonia and it's, it's very interesting how, for whatever reason, when it's a man, I, I could like feel that there are good intentions in there but for whatever reason when it's a woman I was like no it's all manipulation no 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 (laughs) yeah like you've clearly been through this this marriage song and dance before like you know it just is it feels gross um and I think that's cool I think Mm -hmm. that more women should get to play characters that feel gross and feel bad (laughs) <laughs> yes. And then also like, then like ask the follow-up question of like, why doesn't it feel as icky when a man is doing those things? Like, why does that feel yes. normal or like what, what? Yeah. Yeah. And we, it doesn't even register as like, cause a lot of people's reads on Polonius are that he's just a goofy old man. Uh-huh. He's just a uh-huh. little goofy man. He means, well, he just talks a lot. Like, yeah. Yep. No, he doesn't. He's <laughs> no. a real piece of crap. <laughs> he, he's interfering a lot and then like the second his interference goes wrong he's like oh darn I guess well I'll just interfere some more and we'll see how that goes this time yeah Uh, yeah so I think that it would be really cool to see that series of histories with like mother-daughter relationships okay hell yeah yeah all right well I think that is a good place for us to wrap up Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on. I like when I decided I was going to do an official season, I was like, Stephanie (laughs) is a person that must, must, must be on in part because I just really want to hype up your podcast because I think it's really amazing. I appreciate that. (laughs) Also, because I think you are such a cool person. You are so smart and I would love to uplift anything you have to say. (laughs) So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's fun to get to talk about. I feel like the more we talk about it, like little by little things will, things will change and grow. So. And they like the void, (laughs) they slowly, but surely are. I'm, I'm seeing it trickle. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can follow Stephanie, the Protest Too Much podcast, and Bulls with the Bard at the handles either on your screen or in the episode description. And tune in next week as we chat with Bulls with the Bard alum J.C. Payne about magic and how the Shakespeare industry can do better by the Black community. Until then, bye y'all. A thousand thousand sighs to save all lay me where sad true lover never find my grave to weep there